Hey everyone and welcome back to yet another video. Today we are going to be looking at the second part of my review of Shane Dawson's book I Hate My Selfie in which I do in-depth reviews of YouTuber books. Just a little warning, we touched a little bit on this in the last video but as we get further into the book it does get kind of even worse and especially in the beginning of this video there is some quite inappropriate talk about children and chapter four is titled The Original Catfish and it opens with mentions of, I don't think I can say this on YouTube, but CP. So trigger warning for that, if that kind of thing bothers you, you might want to skip the first however long in this video up until this point. So just a warning for that, I know it's uncomfortable for some people and difficult. So chapter 4 opens with Shane sitting at home in his bedroom. He opens his laptop and there on instant messenger he sees, and I quote, so gross, a picture of a flaccid ninth grade boy's with the text, so baby you like under it. And he immediately slams his laptop shut. I feel like I shouldn't even be reading this. I'm grossed out by it. So at this point in the story, Shane is maybe like 14 and he describes himself in high school as the invisible kid. But he doesn't stop there. He also has to make a few insulting jokes in the process. So he writes, You would think that being morbidly obese would make me easier to see but it somehow acted as a cloak of invisibility. My blubber must have had some kind of magical power. If there had been a sad version of the X-Men, I would have been Magneto, and all the special ed kids with their superior upper body strength would have been my student. I have no comments. So in this story, he has a project in social studies class, and he writes, After my teacher asked if I was the janitor, and I told her I was 14, she made me join a group of surfer kids who had a collective IQ of 10 and a collective STD score of everything. I tried to make conversation with one of them. Jokes about literal children with STDs. Why? I, th this isn't even his first joke about children with STDs. He had one in chapter two as well, so how many can one book have? Too many. Safe to say, Shane doesn't get on with this little group that he has to do the school project with, and he writes, That night I went home and decided to do a little research on my group mates to see how I could get along with them. Maybe we had similar interests. Maybe they were closet homosexuals with a fat fetish. It was worth looking into. Again, I don't want to comment. So he MySpace stalks them. <laughs> Here's a fun fact for you. I never had MySpace, I never used MySpace, so I don't have a clue what it's like. Not because I'm not old enough, I'm plenty old, just because I was never cool enough, and when MySpace was cool, I didn't have any actual friends, so I just never had MySpace. So I'm guessing a lot of these like MySpace jokes and references are gonna go over my head, but I'm prepared to deal with that. <laughs> so in his MySpace stalking, Shane finds out that girls think these guys in his class are hot, and so naturally he thinks that makes them horrible people. And then he goes on to make a joke about himself saying, The only person who had ever wanted to fuck me was a homeless lady who used to stand outside of Ralph's and tell me I had a sad face that she wanted to sit on. Once again, this is not the first joke in the book about statutory rape. This is the first one where Shane's the victim and not some poor girl. But I want you to remember all that stuff from the last video we spoke about, about Shane being inappropriate with kids and being repressed and all that stuff and I think this joke here is another example of how Shane doesn't really understand boundaries and consent and age differences and therefore tries to make awkward jokes out of it all. I think the jokes and inappropriate behavior are a manifestation of his repression and his discomfort and his not knowing how to handle any of these things. Yeah that's another kind of telling thing and like I said in last, that last kind of video this explains it it doesn't excuse it. Um, and again, following on from this, the next day in class, uh, Shane has this exchange with the kids he's working with um, about kind of religion and purity culture. And again, it tells a lot about how this affected Shane and his views and where he's at and why he's so kind of repressed. So Shane says to them, clearly shocked, you guys have sex. And then, oh, cool. Sometimes I think about sex. Then I get scared and pray about it. So do you see what I mean? There's definitely hints here of, again, Shane mentioned he'd been brought up in a very religious background, this idea of purity culture making people feel ashamed of their bodies and sexuality and sex in general, and I think this is just another example of how that can be incredibly damaging, but I think it's very kind of interesting, revealing, and a little worrying. Um, then there's a totally real conversation, which definitely happened, in which the kids tell Shane um, that it is bad to be fat because Dr. Hip Dr. Phil thinks obesity is unhealthy. It's all very odd. Have a read for yourself. 
And then Shane starts crying and he has to leave the classroom and that is something that I can relate to and actually have a hell of a lot of sympathy for and empathy for because as a kid in school I had to do that more times than I can count. And the thing is my school locked the toilets during class time, you had to go to reception and get a key so I couldn't go cry in the toilets. I just had to cry in the corridor where anyone walking past could see me and mock me, it was horrible. But the point is, I relate. I think again, this kind of insight into his background, how it affected him, how he got bullied for it, how he responded to that, that could be a very, very interesting story that a lot of people could get something out of and relate to and learn from. I think that would be great. But then he goes and ruins it by making gross poop jokes. And it loses me. I was on board. I was starting to empathize with him. I was starting to understand him a bit more, even if I didn't necessarily like the behavior he was displaying. I was understanding it. And then he just completely loses me and it's disgusting and ugh, and he just undermines his entire point with stuff like this. Then the next part also kind of lost me because while I responded to constant bullying in school with just like staying home and crying a lot and losing myself in books and painting and photography and hurting myself, Shane decides his response to the bullying is gonna be to catfish the bullies. Yeah, I can't relate to that. So then the next few pages are honestly some of the most disgusting things I've ever had to read. I struggled to read it. It's the same kind of discomfort you get when they read out the transcripts into Catch a Basically, Shane spends like three pages describing how he asked this 13 or 14 year old child in his class for photos of his while trying to flirt with him. And I think Shane tells this story to try and be kind of funny and awkward, but it's not funny. It's genuinely disturbing and a little bit disgusting to read and I was incredibly uncomfortable. Basically his goal was to solicit CP from this child, take it, print it and post it all over the school, which is both illegal and incredibly damaging and just an awful thing to do. So he actually manages to get this photo of this child's and in this book that he's writing as a 26 year old man, he describes said child and shames it publicly in this book, which has been read by millions of people at this point. A 26 year old man describing and shaming a child's This is not entertainment, this is disgusting. So the next day at school, Shane bumps into this child in, in the class, because they're still working on this group project together, and Shane has this photo of this in his bag, and he's gonna put it all over the school, and he's gonna shame this kid. But then he sees the child, and he sees that the kid is quiet, and sad and clearly feeling very, very ashamed. This child has clearly been like damaged by this and hurt by this. He's not like some big macho adult. He's a kid who has literally been tricked into sending a stranger a picture of his on the internet. Shane so shows this like sliver of remorse, but he doesn't really seem to understand what he did wrong or why. So he writes, um, I felt horrible. This guy was hurting and it was my fault. I can't imagine how it must have felt to send a stranger a picture of you at your most vulnerable and have them not even respond to tell you how not disgusting it was. The feeling I got from knowing I'd hurt this asshole's heart was even worse than the feeling I got when he and his friends had called me a fat robot animal. It wasn't worth it. So at least he's feeling bad, even if he doesn't quite understand why this kid is so hurt and upset. But yeah, it seems like maybe Shane has learnt something from this which is great, except no, he goes and ruins it in the conclusion to this chapter, which literally says, and from that day forward, I would never again pretend to be anyone who I'm not. Instead, I just photoshopped the absolute shit out of my own pictures to make me look like a completely different person. But hey, don't we all do that? So in a story about soliciting CP, he ends with a joke about photoshopping selfies. You just miss the point completely. And also, sorry, I know this isn't even the point, but no, we don't all Photoshop our photos. Like, I make a point of never doing that. So I'll, I'll do like global color corrections on images and stuff, you know, like w with the exposure and the lighting and that kind of thing. But I will never, ever, ever change the way I look. I don't change the shape of my face or facial features or body. I don't add or remove anything. I just, I think that's wrong. So no, we don't all do that. Maybe don't try and normalize it to your child audience, yeah? But can we just end reading this chapter by all agreeing that the moral of the story shouldn't be I won't pretend to be someone I'm not online and the moral of the story should be I won't solicit CP anymore, please. In the ever so slightly better but 
also still awful realm of things. Our next chapter is titled The How in the Hell Did This Ever Get Published? Between Hollywood and a abortion clinic, which even as an avid pro-choicer I think is a little tasteless, but let's never judge a chapter by its title, let's read it instead. So we open with Shane in a shopping centre. It is 2007 and he writes, I had graduated from high school a year before that and was trying to figure out my next move. I'd lost a ton of weight and got on my signature emo haircut, so I had my sights set on being a Disney Channel star. So no wonder he got on well with Jake Paul. So he's in a shop and we get this whole boring conversation which totally happened with a random woman, uh, which includes her saying stuff like, I'm trying to tell you that you should be on TV. Are you an actor? Followed up by, well, I'm from a big time acting academy where we have young actors come audition for us and if we like them, we get them big Hollywood agents. And being the classy man that he is, Shane is invited to an audition and he says, as she walked away, I had an inkling of, oh shit, she's going to f and murder me. So I took my chances and walked into the nearest teeny, bo teeny bopper store and found the most Disney Channel outfit I could find. Classy. The next day I pulled up to a shady building somewhere outside Orange County. It was two hours from Hollywood and also housed a divorce paralegal office and a planned parenthood, so I should have known this wasn't going to be my ticket to fame. Probably the most tasteless line in the book so far reads, As I entered the elevator that smelled like I looked around at my fellow desperate wannabe stars, mostly terrified looking kids with their parents. Now I'm all for vivid and sometimes uncomfortable descriptions in creative writing, but for me, smelled like a is a step too far. So we get a few descriptions of terrified kids and pushy parents who are clearly there in the room. For example, one girl told her dad she felt like she was gonna throw up and her dad told her to swallow it. As I watched a 12 year old girl vomit in her mouth and then swallow it, I started to second guess whether I should be there or not. Disgusting, awful, but again, I think it actually offers us a bit of insight into what this life is like for these kids with pushy parents and the pressure they face and stuff like that. And yeah. Uh, anyway, Shane starts to realise this isn't some elite audition, it's all a scam. And he realises this when all the kids there have been recruited in the same way, uh, by being flattered by a random woman in a shop. However, he conveys this feeling of betrayal by insulting the appearance of the other kids in a way that just kind of feels cruel to me. It's not very nice. So he writes, I started mingling with the other children and realised that something was fishy. Me. So how do you guys get invited to this? Vomit girl. A lady told me I should be on TV. She also said I was prettier than Hannah Montana. Note. The girl had a lazy eye and some kind of skin disease that made her look slightly reptilian. Can we stop with insulting real people's physical appearance please? Obviously this wasn't a room full of talented undiscovered stars. It was a room full of sad, desperate people who were borderline I saw a mum eating her own hair. She actually ripped out a strand from her head, rolled it around her fingers till it formed a ball and ate it. I don't understand this book. Throughout this whole book, he says these insulting things to try and be funny, but they're just sad and they're just mean and they're just unnecessary. The thing is, there is something we can get out of this book and these descriptions because like I said before, it's actually an intriguing insight into some incredibly unhealthy lives full of hurt people, pushy parents, an obsession with fame and money, and in other parts it shows us how deeply damaging a religious upbringing can be. There's a lot of stuff in this book. The problem is that this book is marketed as humorous stories for teenagers from their idol. All the bad stuff is kind of downplayed and overlooked and in many places glamorized. And I can't help but think that that together is an awfully dangerous thing for young people to read. And I just, I'm not on board with it. Anyway, Shane does the audition, uh, he gets through to the next round where he has the most bizarre conversation ever. And also, is anyone tired of him writing these conversations as this like lazy list of him, me, him, me? It, mm, I hate it. Would it kill you to actually try and write some dialogue? Even a little he said, I laughed, she giggled would be better than this. Alan, so you're the Sean I've been hearing about. Me, actually my name is Shane. Alan. I know, I was testing you to see if you'd correct me. And you did. You failed. Me. Oh. Sorry. Alan. Don't be sorry. Be a welcome, Matt. Let people walk all over you. Feel the pain of Hollywood. And then once you've had enough, you can start to walk all over them. 
Make them bleed and feel sorry for everything they ever did to you. Me. Are we still talking about me? Alan. Sorry, sometimes my passion gets the better of me. I've also had about eight cups of coffee and three muscle relaxers, so I'm all jazzed up. Let's get back to you. Again, it shows us kind of what some parts of Hollywood are like and the people in it being really toxic, especially towards children and young people. It shows us all this, but he never actually really criticizes it. He just makes it this silly little punchline to a joke, which kind of gives the impression of, well, this is just how it is. You take it, you put up with it. This is normal. We all have to deal with it. Let's just have a giggle at it. But he never really does anything to really challenge it, which is where I have a problem. So again, like I say, the whole thing turns out to be a scam to get kids to pay a few thousand dollars for acting lessons from a scammer. And weirdly, Shane is like, I knew it was a scam and still goes along with it. He writes, I know what you're thinking. It's a scam. Why would anyone pay $3,000 to take classes from a dude who sells mugs on Etsy? Because desperation makes people do crazy things. I went home and told my mum about the entire experience. Even though deep down in her heart she probably knew it was a scam, she wanted me to fulfill my dreams so badly that it didn't matter. We were pretty poor at the time, so she had to max out every credit card she could find. I think we even had to get my grandmother to chip in. All I could think about was getting rich and famous and getting my family out of the hellhole we were living in. My parents divorced when I was nine, they both filed for bankruptcy, so since then it had been a daily struggle to make ends meet. The vomit girl and I weren't so different after all, we just wanted out of our current situation. I wanted to be on TV and be a star, and she wanted her, wanted her dad to not go to prison for manslaughter. As deeply disturbing as this is, I have so many feelings about this passage. I mean, it's not Shane's fault that his family was struggling for money, I can completely relate to that. I grew up in a family without any money either. I'm actually a little jealous of his mum and how she really believed in him and his dreams so much and she was clearly just encouraging him to follow them even when it was difficult for her and I, I think that's a lovely thing to see and I'm a little jealous of that and I'd love to know what that was like. It would be nice to have a parent who believed in you that much but the issues I have with this is that he's just glamorizing getting into debt for the pursuit of fame and I can't support that or get behind that that's an awful thing to teach anyone never mind kids but I also find it very revealing that Shane didn't want to be an actor because he loved acting or because he was passionate about the art he states in this he wanted to be an actor simply because he wanted to be on tv and be a star and all he could think about was getting rich and famous which again I think is a kind of awful shallow unfulfilling thing to be promoting to kids and I just find it a little odd but very revealing. Anyway he keeps saying that he realizes it's a scam but he stays there anyway and I'm hoping at the end there'll be some lesson about following your gut instincts and calling out this kind of crap or how to pick up on the warning signs of a scam so his young child audience don't also get taken in by this kind of thing but that might mean this book was actually providing something of value to the reader so I'm not holding my breath. In the end, um, a bunch of people insult Shane's appearance and he takes it all until one of them insults his hair because he draws the line at his emo hair being insulted apparently and he confronts the guy ringing the scam and we get an absolutely revolting joke. Here you go. In an attempt to manipulate Shane, this guy starts absolutely love bombing him with crap like you are one of the lucky few. We are going to get you the best agent we can find, I promise you. A year from now, you are going to be winning a Teen Choice Award and we will be in the audience cheering you on. And then again, and I know I keep saying this where I'm like, this might be the most disgusting line in the book, but again, this may be the most disgusting line in the book so far. Me, so you're telling me that you know some of the kids out there are hopeless. Alan, I'm telling you, some of those kids out there smell like abuse and it turns me on revolting. And then for once Shane actually bothers to call out this, what he said as being awful, because apparently he turns around and says to Alan, you're a horrible, horrible person and I hope you get all the bad karma you deserve. So good for finally calling that out and criticizing it. But the annoying thing is rather than like actually providing any value to the readers, and again I, I like to see something about how do you not get scammed? or some kind of message about hard work or something like that, but instead, Shane ends this chapter with, a few years later, when I won a Teen Choice Award for Choice Webstar, I thought about all the people who had helped me get there, and not one of those people was Alan or anyone from that acting academy next to the clinic, which I can't help but feel just isn't really enough. 
I, like I say, I'd have liked him to end with something about how not to fall for these scams. How about something about him learning to value more than just money and fame? What about him learning something about how you have to really work for what you want and not just throw money at it and try and pay for it? There are a lot of directions he could have gone in. There are a lot of good takeaways he could have had from this story. There's a lot of value the reader could have got out of this and just didn't. He didn't go for any of that. But this chapter did demonstrate that there's a lot of messed up messed up stuff happening in the world and I think Shane just kind of puts it all on display and then glosses over it, never really bothering to examine the significance of it at all, never really bothering to properly critique it and talk about why it's bad, why it's messed up, why it's damaging and how to avoid it and that I think is a real shame and missed opportunity. Chapter 6 is genuinely the best one in the book so far and we learn it's about Shane's grandmother's death and therefore it opens with a revolting joke about diarrhea, which I don't think any of us actually need to hear. Chapter 6 is actually the best one in the book so far, and while I don't like the humour in it, I think there actually is a good point to it and a good story in it, and yeah. So apparently Shane was in Denny's, which I googled, is an American chain restaurant, um, when his grandmother was dying, and I know what that's like when you're sat there waiting to hear about a relative dying and it, it's it's a horrible experience because you feel helpless and powerless and there's nothing you can do. When I was nine and my grandma died, that all happened very suddenly, very quickly. It was a shock to all of us. But in some ways that was easier because we weren't sitting around waiting. Whereas the next year when my granny died and this Christmas just gone when my aunt died. It was difficult because they were in the hospital, we knew they were ill, we knew they were suffering, and there wasn't anything anyone could do to help. Um, th this year with Auntie Josie, no one could even go visit her because corona. So all we could really do was just sit back and wait for an awful phone call while the doctors tried to make it as easy and pain-free for them as possible, but we just felt helpless. Like I say, it, it's horrible and it hurts. And I do think this kind of experience is one that is very universal that a lot of people have gone through. And that's why I think it's important to talk about. It's something that is a good thing to include in a book like this. I think a lot of people go through it. And that's why going in, I had high hopes for this chapter, even though it opened with a joke. I'm definitely 20 years too old to ever find funny. So Shane writes, it was a night of me and my brother Jared constantly checking our phones to see if we had a text from our mum saying she's gone. And then some kind of terribly conceived sad face emoticon, I can't even speak. And I actually think this is a really good mix of humour and conveying that anxiety of waiting. Because it's, it's a nice kind of innocent joke, it's a thing like, oh god yeah, mums are like that. But also, yeah, no, you need a little bit of lightness to deal with something so uncomfortable and difficult. This line works, I like it, I think it's good. He goes on to say, my grandmother was a pretty healthy woman considering she lived on a diet of fat-free cookies and old people candy. So when she was admitted to the hospital, it was a shock to all of us. She complained of her legs hurting, so we figured she had a torn muscle from too much running to the toilet. Unfortunately, it was more serious than we thought. The next morning, I had a voicemail on my phone from my mum. She was calling from the hospital and I could tell it was serious because she didn't start, because it didn't start with her singing some kind of weird owl parody song. And in the next part, he makes more childish and silly and gross jokes. And like I said before, while I completely understand using humour to deal with like difficult and uncomfortable situations, I can't help but feel like in this case, it just, like someone else I know, distracts from the story a little bit. Oh, pardon you. <laughs> Did she just turn right to the microphone? <laughs> Love you. Okay, off. Good girl. Love you. Um, I'm sorry, so... <laughs> Love you so much. So yeah, I can't help but feel like the really gross childish humour just kind of detracts from the important bits of this story and I think, think it's a bit of a shame. Like, I get in this part, he's trying to make a joke out of how he was in such a rush to tell his brother about his grandma, but does he really need to mention his brother's I don't think you do. Um, so then we get some stories about his gran, and some are a little odd, but yeah, who am I to judge? It's family, you know. And what's important here, I think, is that as odd as some of these stories might be, he clearly loved her a lot, and that's what I'm choosing to take away from this section. And then there's actually like a really emotional part where he rushes to go and say goodbye to his grandma, but then when he gets to the hospital, he doesn't even recognize her. And again, I think this is a really important thing that he put in and a really good thing because it's something a lot of people have been through and struggle with and it is difficult when when someone you clearly love a lot is so unrecognizable that's hard and that's something 
that's very difficult for a lot of people to deal with and I think it's one of the best and maybe only redeeming parts of this book so far. I think it's brilliant that he included that bit. Um, he then writes, I broke down into tears and had to leave the room and I did the only thing I knew how to do, vlog. I went to the bathroom and took out my iPhone and started talking to it. I talked about how scared I was to lose her, how mad I was at God for doing this, how horrible hostile bathroom smelled. I spilled my guts and it made me feel slightly better. Which I'm not really sure on like how to react to because on the one hand I do get it. There are times when I'm going through stuff and I do find it kind of easier to sit down with the camera and just kind of talk to it and vent to it and kind of figure out all my feelings and my thoughts by just kind of like talking through it with the camera because it's kind of like talking through it with a friend but when you don't have anyone you can actually talk to because you're in lockdown or it's 3am or you feel very isolated from people or you're scared to be around people like you don't always have that so I also sometimes like I, I have probably hours worth of recordings on my computer that I'm never ever going to show anyone but they're just me talking through my feelings about different things and kind of working through it and whatever. So on the one hand I can see why it might be a little odd but on the other if this is like a genuine coping mechanism for him completely understand it and I'm just you know more power to him. Um, and then it turns out that his grandma gets better for a little while which is like a miracle and he does get to have this like proper goodbye and it gets quite emotional and he's really lucky because that's far more than most people ever get to have so that's really lovely. Um, and then the last few pages of this chapter are just kind of heartfelt family stuff, which I don't have anything really to say about, nothing bad. Um, it's it's quite sweet, really. It must be really nice to have like a family like that. And as much as I don't really care about Shane Dawson as a person, like, I'm happy for him that he has this family that he clearly loves and he had this grandma that he loved and who clearly loved him and cared about him so much. Um, not all of us have that. Not all of us have family who care about us like that and it's it's quite nice to see I guess so yeah that's a good thing I actually overall despite a little bit of off-colour humour that's just not really my style I actually quite like this chapter and wish the rest of the book was like it and there was less of the disgusting problematic stuff and um, and so on that we're gonna end this video here on a sad but high note so I think so far we've seen literally the best and worst parts of the book in this one particular video and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. If you'd like to see more videos on this book um, stick in with the kind of in-depth reviews and stuff then please let me know down in the comments but for now let me know what you thought of the chapters that we read in this video, let me know what you think of Shane Dawson in general and if you've read this book what did you think of it and um, especially if you read it when you were a teenager I'd love to hear your thoughts about what you thought of it at the time. For now thank you for watching I appreciate you a hell of a lot and uh, I'll see you again very soon.